When Master Evil comes to play And Mother says that it's okay Alex and Josh are stole away And made To watch these movies To stay alive Until the day they may I'm, hey, so Andre, do you want me to break out your Circus of the Stars outfit so I can wear it uh, for this episode, or what? <laughs> which, which depends on which one. Hey, the one where you're juggling, dude, and you've got that little tuxedo vest. Yeah, that's, um, <laughs> no, no. no. Um, if you can fit in that, then uh, more there's, power to you. There's but, no uh, way in hell. I couldn't even fit in that when I was six. Like, when I was 12, I was, I was as big as Horace, dude. I was 200 pounds in, like, sixth grade, dude. Yeah, that, uh, uh, by the way, you know, kudos to you for starting off an interview for the first time with that, you know, bringing up that reference of that photo. Well, well played. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that actually, you know, the backstory that that is, uh, uh, that photo wasn't supposed to run in that manner. <laughs> it was supposed to be, cro- it was supposed to be cropped just, you know, with the top and the juggling and they, yeah. they, they somehow left the uh, bare midriff and the acid wash jeans uh, in which is because you know that's what I guess I walked around in on a uh, yeah Saturday oh yeah afternoon so no that was uh, apparently that's everybody's favorite fucking photo on the internet I I just like um I was <laughs> I was just looking up Monster Squad stuff for fun and it, like that popped up in the Wikipedia like the search for Monster Squad it's, and um yeah. I was just like damn dude he's juggling but he's also juggling in a tuxedo top that like he obviously didn't get fitted before the shoot and it's holding on by by the love of god with one button at the top there. <laughs> no that's the that's how those are built. It's um that and look you know say what you will about the uh sequins and the and the primary colors uh <laughs> of that outfit. Uh that is the second iteration of that uh circus outfit. Uh the first one was even worse. Um, I actually stood up for my 14 year old self and said, I'm not wearing that. And, um, so they re they redid it into that. And, uh, you know, those are handmade by like Bob Mackey, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, so those are, those are rhinestones and like, uh, gold lament. Like it, those are, those are custom made to you. Um, and, uh, it, I still have it. <laughs> Are you dude? So the so the same guy who made Jimi Hendrix stage outfits and made Macho Man's robes he, made your outfit for the circus he, and stuff. Yeah, I think uh, I think that I, maybe even for the second time because you used to go down on uh, Wilshire Boulevard and uh, have to have your fittings and um, costuming uh, appointments and all that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. Hey, uh, do you should we do you want me to actually start the show and well, introduce you? Give you. Oh, I thought we were already going. Hey, hey. For hey, the show's going right now, boys and girls. But I've, if, in case you don't know who we're talking to right now, as if he needs an introduction, we're talking to the star of the 1987 classic film Monster Squad. He's also the star producer director of the critically acclaimed documentary 2018's Wolfman's Got Nards, and also he personally, as a as a fan of any 80s te- like television show that ever happened. Andre was on every show that I ever watched as a child. The A-Team, Hogan's Family, Mr. Belvedere. He was on Highway to Heaven, which I watched every day in syndication with my grandmother. And I wanted to ask Andre really quickly about Highway to Heaven. Yeah. Did Shane Black send you in uh, undercover to, to speak to Michael Landon himself to see if you could get him to reprise his role as the teenage werewolf to be in Monster Squad. Did he send you over there for that episode for that purpose? Um, I can uh, I can answer that. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> uh, I I hadn't met Shane yet. I don't think uh, it was okay. the, the, a year a year or two down the road. Um, Damn it. Yeah, I think uh, I think at that moment Shane was still in college, and I was on location shooting Highway to Heaven. <laughs> Dude, Highway to Heaven, I'm telling you, like, that show is kind of dopey, but um, I have great memories of day, day, daytime television with my grandma, because whenever I called in sick, it was like Highway to Heaven, Golden Girls, Dick Van Dyke, Price is Right. Uh, oh. Yeah, Gatorade. That's, to- that's, that's totally grandma of you. That's the great oh. grandma, you know, It was visit. the best. It was that's the best. Bad. And 
I, you know, kids that were coming up and going places in show business, uh, just like you, man, just like you did, they always had those little guest spots where they kind of showed up a little bit, and then they get, like, when you were on Hogan's Family, didn't you have six or seven episodes in ARC? Like, it got bigger and bigger uh, as you got a little older. Like, did you do, like, well, a reoccurring I, yeah, spot? I did. So, I joined uh, the Hogan Family um, uh, for that season, and it was supposed to be five or six episodes. And then the next season, next two seasons was supposed to be like every episode. Uh, and because the, the show had, you know, kind of had been around for a while. Yeah. Uh, Jason Bateman had his two buddies that were always coming in and out of the show. Oh, yeah. And then Jeremy and Danny, they were bringing a buddy in for those two, uh, you know, as, as they got older and had more, you know, kind of storylines. And I was the, the kind of, you know, b- you know, bad kid of the neighborhood, <laughs> apparently. And um, I, I ended up not returning for some reason. I don't know. Um, there's always some weird, uh, you know, speculation, but uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I was uh, supposed to, I, I, I technically joined that cast. Yeah. Uh, that was supposed to be for a couple seasons, and well, uh, I only did one. Andre, now what I understood, because I kind of asked you this question knowing the answer to what happened on the set, dude. So I heard there was some, my mom had a lot of People magazines and mm. In Touch, mm. and I was kind of thumbing through them, and I had heard that you and Mrs. Poole had some beef behind the scenes. Is that true? Depends on what you define, <laughs> how you define beef. Me and, Edie, me and Edie McClurg may have had a thing going. She's, oh, man. you know, Edie's, Edie's awesome. <laughs> I, she's, she, like, she took her career and played, um, two characters and she played them well she was either the really nice neighbor or she was the meddling neighbor it was one or the other yeah or and uh she was actually super super nice and uh about you know is you know with people like that that you just see you know a voice and a face uh that you just instantly go to um you can always you could be like that person's either this or that, mm-hmm. and uh, she is absolutely the 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 best part of what you could think. She could be super sweet, super nice, um, yeah. not as kind of amped up as her characters, but not far. She's super super rad, you know. And she was uh, uh, what was great is that character on that show was <laughs> married to Willard Scott, <laughs> so he was on that show every once in a while. Wait, the weatherman uh, and yeah, Ronald yeah, yeah, McDonald yeah, himself, yeah. and yeah. the original Ronald McDonald. I dropped some um, knowledge there, Josh. You like that? That I knew Willard Scott was the OG Ronald McDonald? That's a, um, that's a I'm a nerd stuff. and I like a, documentaries and stuff. I so. want to see, as we, since we're at the beginning of episode four of Getting Sidetracked, a show we started like three years ago, we're on episode four uh, of our interview show here. Um, am I wrong or did you do some soap opera work as well? I did, a, I did a lot, yeah. Um, I right? actually covered uh, the major three. Uh, I had a small uh, week or so on uh, Days of Our Lives one time. I had a couple days on General Hospital as a tyke. And then I was on Young and the Restless for like two years. So what was it like, if you remember uh, much about it, did, I've heard that like uh, the scripts are so rushed and stuff, and they're getting you know trying to get get everything filmed as quick as possible. Are they literally like holding the lines in front of the actor uh, on the other <clears throat> side of the camera? Yeah. As- so on, uh, yeah, and not not far off. So on daytime, um, and I can only speak to when I was doing it. I haven't done daytime in thirty-eight years, nine years, something like that. Um, it's time for a Jeez. return. Come out of come out of the come out of the thirty year coma from your last I, episode. I, I'd love I'd love to. <laughs> I actually came up with a storyline for my character to return to Young and the Restless. Like, well, yeah, a long, a long time it. ago. It was great. I don't. I think I passed the window now. Um, I'm not good looking enough, and I'm too old, <laughs> or I'm not old enough. Um, but yeah, they. You know, it's a show a day. Yeah, you do an entire episode a day. That's why the yeah. you know, and most of the. Um, uh, you sometimes you get a script delivered at your house late that night, and then when you show up, you'll have revisions, and then they could be writing it as you go, and then you just show up and you just start shooting the episode, and it just and it just runs through. That's why wow. daytime shows look and sound like they do. They're they're very very fast paced, and and there's no there's not a lot of going back and fixing something. 
Yeah. Um, it's, it's, they got to take it as it comes. That's right. So what's interesting is most of the adult actors did have traditional cue cards uh, back when I was there. Uh, but they did not provide cue cards uh, to me. <laughs> Because uh, apparently they uh, don't think uh, younger actors could use them correctly. Um, so you had to know all of your lines <laughs> with no help. <laughs> That's brutal, man. Uh, that is brutal. Throwing you in the I... water, man. Throwing you in the water at a young age. Uh, that, that's funny you say that. That's how my uh, run on the show ended is I drowned in a lake. <laughs> so... Oh, no. <laughs> so uh, wait a minute. Almost drowned in a lake. They thought I drowned in a lake, but then... He finds me. So, that's so was your resurrection idea, Andre, that uh, Tom McLaughlin was going to write your character from Jason Lives? He, uh, Tommy Jarvis was going to show up and put a lightning rod through your chest and a <laughs> lightning bolt was going to hit your ass? And that's yeah, how no, you I get resurrected on Jason <laughs> Little Brooks Prentice did not perish. He was, okay. uh, he was, fa he was found, but uh, he goes off because uh, the whole storyline, because there was a whole... On Ryan R, there's two major families, the Newmans and the Abbots. But at that time, there was three families. And uh, I was one of the other family. And so we had our own kind of giant, you know, drama storylines. And the main issue with um, my circle was uh, this character, Brooks, uh, lived with his mom and dad, but they were really his aunt and uncle. And his aunt and uncle were really his mom and dad, but he doesn't know that. Um, okay. And so that's what he thinks his whole life. And then at the end, uh, there, there's a reveal, and then he goes to chase his dad, uh, and he's up at the cabin. And so he goes out on the canoe by himself that he's not supposed to do in bad weather, and he falls in the lake. Um, and so we did that, actually. It's a very rare time that daytime goes outside. And... Um, Oh. Uh, you know, speaking of, I'm not sure if Bob Mackey's office did this too, but they had to custom make a, a wetsuit <laughs> for me. Oh, right. They're like, yeah. we've, already got, we've got Andre's size in the back. Yeah, the, in a wetsuit. Uh, and this is actually, bef bef that would have been before the first time of Circus of Stars. Yeah. I don't know if it was them or not. It was somebody, same street. Um, you know, I'd go big high end, uh, uh, LA, uh, you know, Taylor fashion shop to make a custom wetsuit because apparently off the rack at the surf store you they didn't make them that small back then <laughs> and, so, uh, and, no, and it had to fit say, like underneath my wardrobe and stuff so it had to be very uh very did different they, did they have you in a tank uh for the water scenes or no it was actually a lake out in uh malibu canyon <laughs> that's pretty rare yeah that's, that is rare yeah yeah i don't they would never do that today <laughs> no they're never I'm gonna kidding. they're never gonna throw a kid in an actual lake you know, you know, now they, you know, they're, they're afraid of shit now. They don't do stuff like that. Either. They're yeah. like, don't worry. The Gill man's in here. Uh, he's making some extra money. His scenes are done on the monster squad. Gives ass in the lake over there. Andre starts slipping up. He'll pull him oh, up. Oh man, this is, yeah, this is like five, four years, five years prior to monster squad. Yeah. Four years. Damn. 83, 80, 83 ish. Huh? Um, yeah. so I, dude, so not only has Andre done, uh, daytime soap operas. Andre also did uh, some Twilight Zone episodes. Yeah. And he, I did. That's actually one of the cool things on the resume. Yeah. Yeah. You worked with Piper Laurie, man. Uh, she's like, I'm serious. Piper Laurie was, even as a child, like when I saw her in Carrie and uh, later on in the faculty and just all these movies, she's, she's a scene stealer and she's oh. legitimate. She's legitimately kind of scary <laughs> to me. Like she's, she's got gravity. She's certainly. She certainly can't. Yeah, that's the word. She certainly does. And yeah. what was what was neat about that uh, shoot? It was um, uh, it was a Ray Bradbury short story that uh, got uh, written into a teleplay uh, by a TV writer uh, who ended up uh, directing the episode. And his name is J.D. Fiegelson. And uh, really cool dude. I, I'm still kind of in contact with him. You know, these years later. Awesome. And he, he lives in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, He's the guy that um, uh, uh, wrote and directed the movie The Scarecrow with Larry Drake. Um, okay. You know that movie? Same guy. So, but what's cool about this Twilight Zone episode is uh, it's me and, uh, like you said, Piper Laurie. And I wasn't too I, – I knew Piper Laurie was somebody. I yeah. just – you know, I'm 10 years old, I think. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not quite – on the page of exactly who this person is, but you can tell 
that she's somebody amazing. Yeah. And then Roberts Blossom was the older gentleman in the episode two, who you recognize from everything, uh, including Close Encounters. And um, I'm sitting there going, yeah, these are two huge people and I'm doing this episode with. And then Danny Cooksey ends up being in the, in the last scene uh, who I actually knew, but um, what's cool. What's, what's cool about that with um, uh, Fiegelson directing uh, the DP on that episode and the grip crew uh, was uh, Bradford May, um, who was also the DP on Monster Squad. That's awesome. Do you think that that connection might have helped you get your foot in the door later on for the film to be cast? Or no, because I don't think Brad, Brad, or any of those, you know, none of the none of the crew crew had anything to do with casting for Monster. Okay. Squad. Um, the, but uh, you know, it's it's a small world. You know, it's, yeah. You know, Hollywood and, and production is a, is actually a small world. Everybody knows everybody, especially That's back cool. in the, back in the day. And uh, this was a you know this is a really cool episode to do, and uh, we shot it out north of LA, kind of where Six Flags Magic Mountain is. Mm-hmm. Um, in a place that's now called Stevenson's Ranch, uh, which used to be all these hills and and kind of scrub oaks and and little ponds and canyons, and now it's suburbs and junior highs and churches and uh, retail shops because it's this huge master plan community out there. But we used to shoot a lot of stuff out there, including um, the actual practical um scenes from monster squad uh where the tree house gets blown up and and the, the actual house in the, the tree house in the tree above the pond was out in that same area he just tosses the dynamite in the fucking tree house it's just yeah. i as a child when your tree house exploded i was pissed because that tree house <laughs> you guys had like it wasn't just this like the standard stand by me looking square sta- uh, tree house you had the oh, extension yeah. like that's right out- yeah yeah, we had the yeah. we had we had the artist loft in the yeah, dude, you had the Cadillac, dude. Rudy's we, over we, there peeping Tom over there yeah. in the window, Horace is eating candy, Turned Ashley's in. stirring up shit. Like it was the ultimate clubhouse, dude. It, it was it was a great treehouse. Before yeah. we seg all the way to Monster Squad, I did oh. want to make note that you know that the eighties Twilight Zone doesn't get enough credit. Out of all the revivals, it is by far the best one. Uh, the two, the early two thousands is like really forgettable. Yeah, and I feel like Jordan Peele's version kind of got the time slot treatment, you know, where it was just bounced around. It was streaming, but it was on. I just yeah. don't, I don't think it got a fair shot, so I can't really give that much of a critique on it. But the eighties Twilight Zone, man, I that I watched that all the time as a kid. That was that was horror for me. So I guarantee I've seen your episode. Now I'm going to have to go back and rewatch it too. Yeah, they were all great, um, and and they redid some of the old classics. Uh, yeah. This was a new one. Uh, you know, speaking of Hogan family, uh, Jeremy Licht's, uh, you know, is in the movie uh, version of Twilight Zone, which is cool. You know, he does. You know, wish him into the cornfield. You know, segment and. You know, doing that episode was really uh, interesting because I was a huge Twilight Zone fan as a kid, you know, seeing it in, in syndication, you know, they in, hold in, up. The, in the 70s they, and 80s. Really oh, that's some of the best television that will ever be made is the original Twilight Zone. Yeah. And it all holds up. It, yeah. And it's all social commentary that still matters. <laughs> the monsters are on, is it monsters are on? Uh, 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 May, uh, May, uh, Mayberry Street or May, uh, Mayfair Street. Yeah, that's... Uh, mm. One of the oh, best yeah. episodes ever. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, you know, uh, Talking Tina still scares the shit out of me. Um, <laughs> Little Girl Lost, I think, is my favorite episode because, you know, the, the the neighbor and the dad use math to figure out the dimensional portal and the wall with Chop. It's like, it's fascinating to me. The Last um, Week Live, uh, that uh, was a great one. Yeah. It's there. You can one forever. <laughs> there's, only, there's only a handful that you're like, those aren't good episodes. Um, they swung and they missed, but... Our episode was really cool, and to know that you're working with someone like Robert, these are all like Academy Award level people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and um, Piper Laurie was really, really interesting, and 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 super just, just a, like you said, there's the, there's a there's a, a gravity to her mm-hmm. um, that's very very easy for her. It, it's not forced, and. You know, you go and you watch something after that, like uh, The Hustler, and realize you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah this, this person knows what she's doing. And so, you know, it's kind of a, it's an interesting, 
you know, it, 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 what's really funny is uh, people play seven degrees of separation with Kevin Bacon. And I almost, I am, I almost, it's always one. <laughs> like I have like one to a lot of things, uh, if not two. And what's really cool about that Twilight Zone episode is that Piper Laurie, uh, who was in The Hustler, uh, which also starred George C. Scott, which I did a series with. <laughs> Wow. Uh, but also Paul Newman, of course, and my sister starred with Paul Newman in The Towering Inferno. Oh, wow. And so, you know, that I've got all of this kind of connection to like George C. Scott direct and then Paul Newman indirect, but direct because I met the guy. I was just born. I was on the set. And, um, you know, it, that something about The Hustler is it, I'm connected to The Hustler with one degree, three different ways. <laughs> Dude, and you're also connected to O.J. Simpson, uh, one degree. He was in The Tower Inferno. Okay, he was. Andre. He, All right. no, oh, trust me, I know this movie. <laughs> you heard O.J. was in it. Okay. Yes, O.J. Well, yeah, I mean, that's why I didn't answer his call when he was in the Bronco call. I was like, no, O.J., yeah. I can't answer. O.J.'s like, A.C., get Andre on the phone. You know who I am, damn it. Get that's him right. on the phone. You heard it here first, folks. Okay, Kevin Bacon, eat your heart out. Six <laughs> no, degrees, a... two degrees. You heard it from Andre. I don't know. I'm sure. I'm sure Kevin Bacon can beat me on on a lot of stuff, but not on the Hustler. <laughs> I've got three one degree. <laughs> uh, so, dude, Andre. So, when? So, can you tell us about uh, how you got the part in the Monster Squad and like what was the audition process like for that? What What happened with that? How'd that uh, come about? Well, you know, it was. Um... Uh, it was a basic kind of, you know, probably a Wednesday afternoon, you know, audition call that you, you know, you get a couple days prior. Uh, what you may or may not know, or some of your listeners, viewers, um, and a lot of the fans know, is I never auditioned for the role of Sean. And uh, my original audition requests, uh, call-ins, were for uh, Rudy. And that makes sense if you you know, no kind of the body of work leading up to that summer of 86. Um, I had done a number of television shows and a bunch of commercials and spots where I was the cool kid. You know, maybe there's a leather jacket, great hair, a lot of hair product. And um, it just was a natural kind of fit, uh, you know, for submissions from the agents. And then the casting directors go, yeah, uh, we want Andre to come in and read for this role. Here's the character description and the sides, uh, you know, Wednesday at four o'clock, whatever it is. And you know, back in that day, this is, uh, you know, 86. So, you know, probably from 85 through 88, well, I was doing Mr. President in 88, but even still, uh, 85 through 89, um, I was, you know, you're probably in an audition room at least twice a day, five days a week, uh, yeah. maybe, maybe more um, on average. And I can't remember if I had multiples that day or not, but you go over, I think it was, you know, Penny Perry's office in Culver City, and you read, you know, these sides for this character named Rudy, supposed to be cool, hadn't read the whole script yet, you know, because you show up early, you get the sides, you read, and you wait to see if you get called back. Uh, came back, had callbacks, had to go in and read again for Rudy. Um, uh, I think we did almost uh, another read with producers. I don't think it was an actual screen test, you know, on camera or anything, but... Uh, uh, you know, a couple weeks later, um, you know, your agent calls and uh, says, hey, you know, that uh, the movie you read for a couple weeks ago, they cast you in it. And you celebrate and uh, you go, all right, which one? <laughs> you know, which movie? Because <laughs> back in the day, we're all reading for everything multiple oh, times yeah. a week. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's bonkers. And uh, they said, no, that monster movie. And I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, the cool kid that kills everybody. Because by that time, I had read the script and uh, and knew more about it. And they go, yeah, except for they didn't cast you for the role that you read for. And that's usually a bad thing. Because they usually they're like, oh, I liked you, but we're going to give you a smaller role. Mm -hmm. And I had read the script. And I was like, there are no other roles. Like, what am I, one of the bullies? I'm like... <laughs> I'm Derek or EJ? No. Jason Herbie. Yeah, Jason yeah, Herbie. Yeah. And Jack um, Black from Never Ending Three. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, no. And they're like, no, no, no. This is a good thing. They cast you as the lead. Hell and I'm yeah. like, and I and I remember very vividly saying, No, the cool kid. I want to play the cool kid. That was the that was a good role. And he has the jacket and he smokes and he kills all more monsters and he gets the girl. And like, that's a cool character. And they're like, 
They're like, no, 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 you're the lead. And I'm like, no, Rudy's the cool <laughs> character. So that's that's always been a uh, you know a fun story to tell and a running joke between Ryan and I. Um, but I know exactly why I wasn't Rudy. Um, uh, you know, f- you know, for the last 15, 20 years, I mean, Ryan Lambert walked into that audition and murdered it and became Rudy in that, in that room, he became Rudy. And, you know, I've always, I didn't really think about it for a long time until, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, uh, you know, during sort of like the beginning of the resurgence or the, you know, the, the middle of the peak of the resurgence. And I said, I never auditioned for Sean. I, I never came back and read. I never had a meeting. They just straight cast me as the lead to this movie. That's awesome. Who did that and why? Yeah. And, you know, because then you realize that you're very fortunate that that happened, that you made some sort of impression with a leather jacket and all, you know, great hair reading Rudy lines for them to say at the end, okay, we are, we've got to cast the lead. Um, we read everybody in town uh, and they didn't pick anybody. And somebody said, what about the kid, mm-hmm. Andre, that we read as Rudy? Could he be Sean? And then everybody apparently said, yeah. Um, That's I finally, amazing. I, yeah. So, it, you know, it was sort of a, a, a weird kind of uh, thing to kind of process for years. And, uh, you know, I, I finally thought to ask Fred <laughs> that question. And um, he goes, you know, I think it was Peter Himes. And I was like, oh, thanks, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. But, yeah, uh, I, yeah, he's like, it, it wasn't, wasn't me. me. It, was it was Peter. Else. It was somebody else. So um, he stuck me with you. I was like, oh, great. I'm glad. I'm when, glad I out. Dude, Andre, when we were kids uh, at my elementary school, I know that Josh played uh, Jason Voorhees at his grade school, uh, but we played Monster Squad and Saved by the Bell. Uh, yeah. I, I always wanted to be Zach or, or AC Slater, and then you always wanted to be Sean or Rudy. And yeah. I was always Horace. Horace. I never... I didn't have the my you oh, were yeah. Andre basically looked like my brother Aaron the spoiler who spoils every movie and television show plotline ever. He's a he's super oh. villain by the way. Yeah, he's the spoiler. I, I do so, that. Too. Game of Thrones, uh, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul. Don't talk to my brother if you haven't seen it. He'll ruin it. <laughs> um, but I always wanted my brother looked exactly like you, Andre, dude. Like it took him fifteen minutes in the morning to feather his hair like Ben Stiller and Dodgeball, just lethal, <laughs> dude. He'd, ha- he'd have that L.A. Looks bottle. He'd use, like, a quarter of that shit. Yeah, that and then he'd have, stuff. Yeah, L.A. Looks. He'd feather it. He'd get his uh, his pink, like, skateboarding T-shirt that he got from some, mm. you know, magazine at a bike shop in the, mm. in the 80s, man, and he'd head out the door. But you were the cool – dude, whether you believe it or not, you were one of the coolest kids in the 80s, dude. Hands down. Well, I appreciate that. I, I was very fortunate to um... – you know, there's an interesting dynamic when you look at, you know, when you look back and you see the whole picture, um, you know, and at that time, you know, there wasn't a lot of programming for kids. There wasn't a lot of uh, characters on TV or in films that were kids and there wasn't a lot of stuff about kids. And but there was a ton of kids in the business and you know them all, especially in your four or five years of age range. And then you probably know the, you know, the older ones, too, if you're around. And the younger ones. Um, And I kind of look at it and and see that about 20% of the kids in any sector do about 80% of the work. And I apparently um, was in that 20%. Uh, You know, I, I, I worked a lot more than most and, you know, didn't work as much as some. Uh, But, you know, you mentioned I was on, you know, a ton of awesome shows and, Yes, that's true. Um, but there's also a reason because my television career, which is, you know, the more robust, uh, and I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a television fiend. I love television. And because uh, I grew up watching it. I grew up on it. <laughs> I grew up in television. Like, this is, it, TV, I'm a, I love movies. Movies are fantastic, but I'm a TV junkie. And uh, it's because my television career, I'm the guy, the kid, that did five or six or seven network shows that only went one season or two seasons instead of doing one show for seven years that everybody knows you for. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and a lot of my friends are those ones that did a show for six, seven, ten years. <laughs> and they only did one thing. 
Yeah, you actually. Uh, you know, so I, because I bounced, because I didn't do one show for ten years, I was available to go do all these other things. No typecasting. I was just gonna say that, Andre, you might have kind of hit the the casting lottery, dude, because they didn't see you as just one thing. They're like, we can't. And I, I said I wasn't gonna do this again to Josh, but uh, Jaleel White, like, you didn't get typecast as one character, and they're like, nope, we can't cast you ever again. You're forever Urkel, forever. That's right. Uh, that's right. It, you know, it's tough, and that, that actually, I mean, it happens. It absolutely happens. Uh, oh, yeah. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we, we, sometimes they, whoever is, can break out of it. Um, I think there are some great examples that have broken out of that. Um, you mentioned, um, you mentioned Saved by the Bell. I think Mark Bar Gosler has did a fantastic job breaking out of that. Um, cause his turn, his turn on NYPD blue is absolutely fantastic. Oh, that, that um, was great too. Have you seen raising the bar? It, he got one season where he was a defense attorney. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. He's, that was fan, really good he's really good. And, um, you know, he's also good on the, um, uh, you know, Vanderbeek's fantastic. James Vanderbeek. Oh, Vanderbeek Van is, uh, he, is like deceptively funny by the yeah. way. Oh, he's definitely he's, good. And he's it's you know he's in a he's in a film right after Dawson's Creek. Um, uh, um, oh, just blanking on it. Um, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, that that I I just dig, and I think everybody he's just complete departure. And I think sometimes that's by choice, sometimes that's by happenstance. But uh, you know, Jaleel didn't get that opportunity. No one gave him that. Yeah. Um, you know, <clears throat> David Faustino didn't get to not be Bud Bundy. You know, for a while. Um, and I, I think that's unfair, but I think, you know, sometimes they're right. They're like, no one's ever going to see you as anything else. David, um, David but, knocked out that role, Andre, on Married with Children. I mean, my, Married with Children was on air for, like, my entire childhood, like, 12 years. It was highly successful. When Fox first came out, it was, like, Simpsons, Married with Children, and Cops. And, it was, like, David was, Bud Bundy was one of, besides Kelly, when I was going through puberty, <laughs> David was like my favorite thing to watch on the show. He was great. He was my age. He's great on the show, and um, it yeah, I know all about that first year of Fox because I got offered two shows from the new network. What two shows? And uh, one was um, Mr. President. Okay. With George with George C. Scott and Conrad Bain, produced by seasons, uh, right? Produ yeah, yeah, because it was guaranteed okay. to go two seasons, and George C. Scott was doing television for the first time. And it was the biggest names in television, um, including Johnny Carson's company, was producing it. And they were paying a lot of money. And um, that show was guaranteed to go two seasons. The other show, the pilot, wasn't even guaranteed to air and had nobody associated with it that anybody knew. I'm going to give you one guess, Alex, of what show that was. Married with Children? Yes. Or did they want you to play Bud? Yeah, I was, I was, offered, the, I was offered that show. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so did you talk to Michael Faustino on the set of Monster Squad and say like, hey, hey, uh, <laughs> no, that was after. Oh, okay. I was going to say, oh, I was yeah. like, hey, uh, you kind of pull him aside. You're like, listen, you think there's a monster in your closet right now? You little son of a bitch. I'm going to be the monster in the closet <laughs> for you not helping me make a better decision. No, I'm teasing, dude. <laughs> 12 yeah, no, years. It, you know, Michael, Michael was great. Um, and I, you know, I knew David, you know, from a young age, you know, growing up in the business together and, um, we had mutual friends and we hung out and, you know. Like I said, it's a very small world back then. Were, um, Andre, were you did so? If you know, if you knew David Faustino really well, were, were you familiar with Corin Nemec at all? Of course, uh, dude. Parker Lewis can't lose. Uh, yeah. Synchronize your swatches. Oh, yeah. uh, we, we, my friends and I said that from third grade <laughs> to college. We yeah. synchronized our swatches. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 Corky to us is great. You know, uh, <laughs> he wasn't Corin back then; he was Quirky. Um, yeah, it was a great show. It was, it was a little. It was it was later in the bad. I think I was doing Hogan Family and then off to college when Parker Lewis was going off. But um, uh, yeah, yeah, as I said, it's a small world and um, a lot of great people on Parker Lewis. Actually, a cool show. Um, and you know, and that happens. So um, you know, there's a handful. Everybody has stories like that where they were doing a show uh, and it got canceled and they couldn't do another show or they came close to getting it. Because like I said, we all everybody reads and gets close. Um, you know, everybody reads for everything. And then sometimes you get close to a lot of different things that you, you wish you did. Um, you know, we all have those handful of stories The the choosing, the, the choosing the shows on Fox, you know, is, a at the time you make the right decision. Sure. Um, 
but I wouldn't, um, I, I doubt I'd be sitting here today talking with you guys. So, um, you know, if, if, if the last 35 years hadn't happened or 34 years hadn't happened the way it did, um, you know, had I been on that other show, you know, who knows, but, um, it, it, it's, uh, you, you can't, you can't, you, you know, you can't go back in time. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I'm glad, you know, someone like Dave, uh, you know, it, it is that because it became iconic and we can all celebrate that. Um, it, what's funny about that, about, uh, Fox and those shows is leading up the couple of years to that, just before Monster Squad, Monster Squad year, and then going to Fox, because I got cast, I I did the Mr. President show, got cast in that prior to Monster Squad coming, being released. And so I was already on a new network show when Monster Squad comes out and doesn't do well in the box. That was already on to a, a network show for two years. So, um, but leading up to that, I had sort of been uh, in a kind of development deal situation um, off of the 20th Century Fox lot. And I was working with uh, two producers named Michael Zenberg uh, and Randy Zisk, who are giant television names. Randy was young at the time. Michael was already established because he used to produce shows like um, Maud and uh, like the original New Heart show. Maud and was um, good. so, you know, and he's coming into the to the to the early and mid 80s and creating these sh shows for networks off of the Fox lot. And he cast me in all of them. And uh, one of them was a, was a great show about four boys and their dad. And um, that ran into some bad luck. I think that show would have actually been successful and gone for a couple of seasons. Um, but I kept doing all of these guest spots off of shows off the Fox lot. I was doing all the Zinberg Zisk shows and they were creating a show that I was supposed to be the lead in. Uh, and then I did uh, one of those series was a show called Heart of the City. And that uh, was a, a, a cop show um, about an L.A. homicide detective who has to raise his two kids because uh, the wife dies in a drive-by. <laughs> it's, it's very 80s. It's very 80s. So the, 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 the wife of a cop gets is, somehow is near a drive-by shooting and, and, and gets uh, murdered. Uh, um, and then the show is about this cop trying to do his job and also raise his two kids. And... Uh, I was not one of the kids. I was actually the criminal that he has to arrest in the pilot episode. And then he gets involved with my storyline and my mother, who was Kay Lenz. Um, and so I had a recurring role on this really cool kind of cop drama show that I thought should have gone longer and been, and it, it, it could have been a little better. I thought it was great. Um, it but the, talk, right? the, no, the, no, it was, okay. uh, yeah, no, uh, <laughs> definitely no. Um, <laughs> But the other two kids that were the the offspring of the lead uh, were Jonathan Ward and Christina Applegate. And okay. all three of the kids from that show ended up on original Fox Network shows. And because um, we all got offered our own show. Kids <laughs> and, uh, supposed so to happen Because it, it, was, it was all coming through the studio and, you know, off the lot there. And um Jonathan went and did a show called The Adventures of Beans Baxter. He would be like this kind of genius, nerdy inventor, crime solver kid. Um, kind of a cool show. And uh, Christina, of course, did Married to Children. And I did Mr. President after passing on Married to Children. <laughs> uh, Andre, when, so when Monster Squad came out in like 87, so I was really surprised that it was like labeled a cult film because in my memory... I just remember loving the film, going on the weekends to rent it at the video store. Um, it was like, if you went to my local video store and, hey, mm -hmm. who the hell checked out Monster Squad? Nine times out of ten, it was me. Because right. this, this was back in the old like So Monster Squad came out, and you guys didn't get a VHS release. So it came out in 87. Mm -hmm. You probably didn't get an actual tape of it till like, 89. Like, because the studios would hold. Like, Batman mm -hmm. Returns came out in, like, 92. I don't think it came out on VHS till I think last week, early last week. So yeah, <laughs> Batman. Yeah, about thirty years, um, yeah. possibly. Uh, but no, back in the old days, before streaming, kids, all the slashaholics watching this, you would have to wait years for a movie to come out on VHS. So double. Yeah, I just remember Monster Squad being huge in my mind. I guess I didn't understand box office or 
anything like that. Um, and I, it was just always a big movie in my mind. So I was really surprised when I saw your doc- documentary. Right. Can I yeah. add something to that real quick? Yes. Because uh, I, I was going to ask you this myself. Uh, me and him are on the same wavelength, apparently. Uh, would you, like, because I know you had a lot of tough competition. Like, I believe Lost Boys uh, came out the week before. It was about two weeks, yeah, two weeks yeah, prior. Yeah, you know, and that was a huge thing, too. But also, wasn't there, like, some misdirection with the way the film was promoted? Like, it was almost promoted like a full-fledged horror movie, or but then some of the ads made it look like it was, like, just for kids. I mean, was there a lot of confusion, you, you think, that led to that, or just the tough competition? Because it was a great movie. I watched it as a kid and loved it. It was one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, too. it's uh, when you, uh, when Alex, you've seen it because you've mentioned it, but you know, if you, uh, in the documentary, we go into those specifics a little bit of oh. why it didn't, you know, what, why didn't it connect or hit? Mm-hmm. And I think you mentioned, you know, probably two or three of the five or six that I think were actual factors. Uh, one was uh, timing of the release, uh, but it, bef- not even that. It, it, it wasn't so much the weekend. Um, it, it was a, a number of factors. One, the 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 rating didn't help. It was a PG thirteen, which means you had to go with an adult. And you know, back in the day, parents wanted to drop their kids off at the at the movie theater or at the mall, or you wanted to get on your bike and go with your buddies to the to the theater and and watch the movies. And you weren't. No one was taking you there, mm-hmm. and you couldn't get in if it was PG thirteen. So I think that didn't help. The other thing was, you were right, with the advertising, they had kind of like parallel weird marketing campaigns. The trailer looked scary and dark as shit. And um, parents were like, I'm not taking my kid to this movie. I'm not taking my 10 or 12-year-old to this movie. Uh, And then, you know, what's interesting is the other campaign looked a little campy and kid-oriented. And so what I think happened, for the most part, not just the rating, uh, not just the Lost Boys taking kind of attention, um, but... Uh, a combination of all of that, a combination of the, the the parents not wanting to accompany six kids going to watch, you know, foul mouth, you know, group of misfits. Uh, it, it was also the perception of it. Plus, all the re- all the reviews sucked. Like there was very few good reviews of this movie, and the the kids who would go buy the ticket for the cool 14, 15 year olds. They're like, oh, that kid's, that's a kid's movie. I'm not going to go see that. I'll go see something like Lost Boys. I'm too cool to go see that. Gotcha. And then the 10 and 11-year-olds were like, that movie's too much for me. I don't want to go see it, or my parents won't let me go see it. So there's a very small window of actual audience mm-hmm. that didn't exist back then, but certainly exists now. And we made the first tween movie. I was <laughs> you know. And so, you know, that wasn't a thing. That wasn't a marketed uh, demographic at the time. And had the studio, you know, if it was, I always joke, if they knew that and they were marketing this for tweens, uh, you know, those 12 and 13 year olds uh, that are going to go and enjoy it, uh, we would have just wrapped on Monster Squad 11 Breaking Dawn. <laughs> I. So yeah, we, you guys would have been on the side. You guys, listen, instead of Burger King, you guys promoting Burger King, they would have been paying you guys to right. be on that's, the sides of the cups, dude. That's right. Life. That's right. So it's so uh, personal. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a you hit you hit the nail on the head on on more than one of the factors. So it wasn't one thing. It was a combination of four or five things. Um, and, you know, the other thing, the the the. If those were nails in the coffin, so to speak, the shovel of dirt over the top of it was the fact in 1987 and box office um, uh, success is measured by some dude sitting in an office somewhere, either at a studio or at a theater chain. And they arbitrarily put a number on movies and say, if you don't reach this by Sunday at noon, your movie's gone. Mm -hmm. And so there's very little time for word of mouth. Uh, So you have about a 48 hour, maybe 72 hour window for your movie to, to connect. Yeah. And what happened with Monster Squad, the kids that did go see it in the theater, let's say on a Saturday afternoon or a Friday night with their dad, um, go to school on Monday and go, Alex, holy cow, man, I, I'm going back on Saturday. I just saw this cool movie. I really dug. You got to come see it with me. And you're like, oh, that sounds rad. I couldn't go. I had baseball practice, you know, on Saturday. But let's yeah. go. 
Uh, and then you go to the mall the next weekend and the movie's already pulled because it didn't succeed the first weekend. So that quick, you know, that quick, you have 48 hours, maybe 72 to get to a certain arbitrary number that somebody decides if you get another weekend. See, me and Alex don't do critics. Like we, we tell our audience, you know, we'll talk about a movie if we like it or not, but we're like, go make your own decision. We're not mm -hmm, going to yeah. tell you if a movie's horrible or whatever. Even in our riff show, we just have fun with it. Yeah. Now, like, I was going to ask you, like, I, I read that the movie released at the end of August, and it's definitely got, like, a Halloween feel to it. Kind of like Ghostbusters Afterlife uh, released in late November last year. You would think that movies like, like that and, like, Monster Squad, you think it would have performed better, like, uh, mid to late October? Or... I mean, I think... I th think you it, it certainly may have um but those are studio and distributor decisions um but i think the reason that it was released it was mid-october like the second weekend uh, okay. uh was because the kids are still out of school oh okay yeah so i think that's yeah to go right. with their that's to, to yeah. even go on a thursday afternoon or something but if you don't let it last till the next thursday it doesn't matter if they're in school or not so um, you know, and that's what happened with Monster Squad. You know, uh, it became a schoolyard reference movie. It became a word of mouth uh, after it was on HBO, after you recorded it on a blank Maxell tape and then passed it around the neighborhood to your buddies in the in, in the cul-de-sac. Tape traders. Yeah. And then the same thing at the video store. You go in and rent it every Thursday or Friday uh, and keep it all weekend. And... Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that same story or the story where I went to my local video store because we all had them. Mine was videos to go. And, um, uh, you know, you go in every weekend and rent this movie so much so that you end up just keeping it and stealing it. And your mom's <laughs> credit card gets hit for the hundred and five bucks with the licensing or uh, the manager of the place just goes, just take. Just take the movie. Just just take it. Quit coming in here. Just take it. I'm giving it to you. Don't come in here anymore. And you couldn't buy them back then. You couldn't just go to Walmart or something. No, they didn't have like that. You, tape yet. That's right. You couldn't buy them, but if you kept them, you got hit with that licensing fee because every yeah. single box had a license in it. Oh, and yeah. uh, that's why it was so expensive. And it was a weird – it was an interesting time, but uh, – uh, I mean, those are great stories of kids going to the VHS store and renting it uh, or taping it off HBO and, and passing it around the neighborhood. That that licensing thing, Andre. Um, so my mom rented uh, the SNL classic. It's Pat. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, cool. it, so it was probably in the theaters for about half a day. OK, so yeah. this movie made this movie made less than we're going to make uh, at the box <laughs> office with this podcast episode. So somehow I forgot. I forgot where I put this this tape i don't know what happened to it okay video and more which was our local video store calls my mom like two weeks later and they're like hey if you don't bring it's pat back within the next week or so we're gonna hit you with the licensing fee <laughs> and it was like over 300 dollars. and this is like 1992 yeah yes. um and we were living like paycheck to paycheck. My mom, I've never gotten a worse spanking in my life than for this <laughs> stupid movie. Why uh, was it your was it your fault that it didn't get returned? I was the one who asked her, like we went to McDonald's and I was like, hey, let's go. Hey, well, you know what make this day perfect, mom, is if we went and got a tape or something. And then I saw because I saw Wayne's World. So I was like, oh, Wayne's mm. World was good. SNL movie. I love uh, the Blues Brothers. I bet you this is going to be good. Lorne Michaels doesn't miss, you know. <laughs> it was just the biggest shitter I've ever seen in my life. Lost it. And then I, oh, I took oh, an ass whooping of a lifetime from my mom. Lost lost yeah, it. almost lost How it. Did you, and then got why, why, where would you lose that? Like, it shouldn't be anywhere. <laughs> it trash like, can. It I was been probably right back, nine, back and I was car. like, this sucks. And, like, threw it like threw it in the, gar the hedge or the bush outside or something. I don't know. Right. It's so crazy that you said that because our local video store was called Movie Land Balloons and Beans. I never saw one bean in this place. I saw plenty of balloons. Uh, mm. I don't know what I don't know what the name meant. It's maybe Jelly Beans or something. I don't know. Huh. Anyway. Mm. I have rented Coneheads, okay, and and I didn't want to take it back, so I hit it and said I lost it and said one of my six siblings, you know, must have done something. And my mom took me to the video store and asked them how much it would cost, you know, since it was lost. And they're like $312 <laughs> for 
she couldn't believe it. They pulled out a list and showed us what it cost yeah. them to buy the movies that they put on the shelves. And that's when I learned about the licensing thing you're talking about. It was like two hundred, three hundred dollars per movie that they yeah. had on the shelf because it's like yeah. I guess it was higher quality. Um, well, dude, Blockbuster, <laughs> Blockbuster changed the game uh, later on. They like negotiated a licensing deal. So, like, if you rented a VHS tape of Monster Squad at Blockbuster, instead of having to assume the like buy the entire tape for four or five hundred bucks, they would just send. The, like the movie distribution company a percentage every time it was rented. So that's how Blockbuster was able to have like 400 copies of Monster Squad. That's how they basically took over uh, VHS, you uh, know, uh, rentals uh, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you, and, and you mentioned Coneheads. That's actually one that knocked it out of the park. It's, uh, that was one of the movie SNL movies that was better than the sketch. <laughs> oh, yes, I loved it. I loved Coneheads it. is fantastic. Everybody's Chris so Farley, Chris Farley in Coneheads, he's, he's probably has... 10 lines of dialogue, right? And he's probably in probably, I don't know, 15 minutes of the entire hour and a half. He right. steals every scene he's in, dude. It's, yes, he's he amazing in that movie. you like. <laughs> Love Coneheads. Love Coneheads. The dentist appointment was uh, one of my favorite parts as a kid. Open wide. <laughs> wider. John, Lo John Lovitz, dude, before high school high. John Lovitz is still, like, the man at that point in comedy. He hasn't right. jumped the shark yet. Uh, <laughs> hey, so... Dude, so Andre, I so when I was kind of watching the documentary, kind of doing a little bit of research, I noticed that you know Ryan and you have a podcast together. You guys have done digital shows together. You guys are pretty close. It seems like. Um, are you so? Are you close with anyone else from the cast? I mean, I don't really see you hanging out with. Uh, I mean, Ashley's involved a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. When you guys go to places, but what about yes. other members of the cast? It's def definitely Ryan and I are, uh, are definitely closer than any of the others i mean ryan and i are you know kind of closer than a lot of my, my other close friends too just because we spent so much time together over the last you know 15 years or so um we were good friends when we were kids for a while and then we both grew up and we went you know did different things you know i left um you know the next season after i wasn't on the hogan family um I concentrated on like my senior year in high school and i played sports and then i went to college to play basketball in college and um, so I just kind of left the industry for a while. Ryan went off to be in, you know, rock bands and then moved to San Francisco for almost 20 years. And I lived in North Carolina for, you know, 10, 12 years. And, you know, we, we, we got back together in the, you know, mid 2000s, of course. And we just, you know, we, it just kind of, um, it just kind of like re, you know, just kind of rolled again like ryan and i were just cutting up and laughing and being funny and that's where the podcast came from we did that for about a year and change and um it was super conversational and fun we had great guests and you know it was uh, we just came up with our own it was just us talking with people and uh this was before you know every before zoom before skype you know was kind of like oh, super yeah. popular to do video casts and um you know ashley we you know i just stayed and i house at ashley's house a week uh, uh, last month when I was in uh, in I was there for like a week and um, she was like just stay at the house and watch the house and uh, I've got some zucchinis growing in the back if there's any that look like need to get plucked out put them in the kitchen I was like here you go there was a giant one in there it was crazy and um, <laughs> so it, you know and uh, Ryan and I just spent a lot of time together I mean we were just uh, at at two appearances together in the last couple of weeks and we we shot a movie together in Ohio. Oh, nice. um, that um you know which is which is cool because now that the world is turning and um you know things are happening again uh the stuff that i had started you know to kind of get out and do three years ago that all got shut down um are now happening and so we can reinstitute that and one of those things is uh, you know sort of an offshoot or a result of our show Short Ends, which I created and sold to a, a Nerdist and a Legendary Digital uh, that Ryan and I co-hosted. It was a show that I wanted to showcase short films and uh, the filmmakers. Because okay. unless you go to a film festival, most people don't get to see the short films that are made, and these can be really enjoyable. They can be programming. You, you, know, you, you bash them together and you curate a cool lineup and it's great entertainment. And then sometimes these launch careers, and that's what I wanted to 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 do. And I wanted to start a show that, you know, two three years down the line, you know, we have some giant, you know, Marvel movie director that, you know, his his or her short was on our show, and um, you know, we you know we kind of showcase that. 
And um, now things are starting to do a little bit more with shorts like um, Alter and Dust. Um, you know, they're Gunpowder and Sky Studios. Those are channels that that do just short films. And, you know, Ryan and I, you know, we're, we couldn't be any more different people. <laughs> like, literally, we're the opposite. He seems, he seems reserved and kind of quiet from, but may, I could be totally off. It, I could be totally off. What's, what's, what's great about Ryan and I is we're completely different human beings. Yet we're very similar and have the same sense of humor and same sensibilities, but yet different outlooks on things. But what's great about Ryan and I, um, and to some point, Ashley, you know, uh, uh, when we go to uh, appearances, it, but we can riff off each other. We know exactly what's going to happen. There's a setup, there's a joke, there's a thing, there's a situation, there's an old callback to a joke that we're going to bring up in a conversation. We love to host events. We like to MC things. That's where we're good. And like Q and A's with fans, like they love it because it's a shtick. It's like it's like we're the Smothers Brothers. And but the difference is, I, I'm not the straight guy and he's the clown. We can switch. Oh, okay. That's and we super can valuable. Yeah. We can we can we can switch in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> and you know, I I can do the joke as the straight guy one minute, and ninety seconds later, he's doing the joke and I'm playing the clown. And it just goes that way. And so it's really fun. And, uh, you know, so we started working on projects and did that and everything shut down. And then when things started happening last year, uh, I had a, um, I've had an interesting, you know, you know, 12 months of, you know, the last half of 2021 and the first half of 2022, uh, I had to concentrate on some other things, which were a little more personal, a little more health wise and a little more domestic oriented. And, um, all those, you know, two major things in my life ha happened at the same time and uh, had to deal with that for a while. So I, I, it was slow going, getting back into, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the mix, so to speak. But uh, one thing that, you know, we had started to do a number of years ago coming out of that show and then how we, you know, traveling around is we, we love to act. We love to work. We love to be in people's shows and in their movies and what happened, and we started to really have an affinity for local and regional and short films and, you know, people just trying to make something. Um, and because, look, we, I, I reversed engineered a career. You know, most people start out local, they start out small, then they move to L.A. and then maybe they get a break and they get on a TV show. Uh, and then they, you know, 20 years later, they're, you know, in movies. Uh, I started out as a five-year-old in motion pictures and on network television, and now I'm start. I'm I'm kind of reverse engineering the reverse engineering, and I I I, I enjoy going back to those smaller roots. They're not mine; they're other people's. But I miss yeah. that, and so I want to latch into that. And and Ryan and I feel the same way, and we we love. Um, you know, filmmakers that are doing regional or local or lower budget or indie type stuff or, or big motion pictures, it doesn't matter. Uh, but a lot of times they, even, even friends of ours that are established filmmakers or screenwriters, they will not ask us to be in their project because they don't think we'll do it. They, and, and if they're Monster Squad fans or Kids Inc. fans or whatever, they, they'll never approach you. And because it's a whole other world. And we're like, no, we all do the same thing. Like, you're making a cool movie. Where's my audition? And they're like, I would never ask you to be in my little thing. And I'm like, I not, this is what we do. Like, let's do this. Like, at least give me an audition. And people, they, they their minds get blown. They're like, you would want to do this? I'm like, yes, this is what we do. This is, this is, we're actors. We want to perform. We want to participate. Yeah. And now it's interesting because we are names of some you know, status and faces of old gray bearded men now. And we Me too. <laughs> that's right, you know, and you know, if we can help your production, if you want to work with, you know, Ryan or myself or both of us, um ask. <laughs> like so, ask. Slash, so slash tracks when we do slash tracks the movie. Uh, yeah. give, you, give Andre a call, all right? The yes. movie. <laughs> the, the only, you know, and so what I tell filmmakers and, and producers and writers when they don't know how to make that happen, because uh, a lot of times you go to convention and you meet someone like, would you be in my movie? Yeah. And then you're like, you're like mm, I should probably not. Um, and you, and there's sometimes you shouldn't. But I always at least ask questions. And I ask three, you know, I say, if you can answer these three questions, then we can discuss this. 
And one is, do you have financing and a production schedule? Are you rolling cameras at some time that you know? Uh, do you, are, do you, um, are you aware and knowledgeable of the SAG paperwork that you have to have to have actual, uh, uh, actual SAG actors on your set? Yeah. It's not rocket science. It's a very easy process. Your whole shoot doesn't have to become unionized. You just have to do certain paperwork for your actors. Uh, if you'll do that, and then you'll bring me or us in, and we'll talk about you know what that takes. Uh, I will read the script, and if you if you have those three questions, then it's a viable opportunity. It honestly um, sounds a lot like uh, when I was in pro wrestling. I ran my own promotion for a while. When I, I also did the wrestling too, but you know we had to have our uh, wrestling permits. We had to have it was kind of like yeah. a wrestlers union type thing. Sure. You know, it's it's it, and it wasn't super complicated once you knew what you were doing. But I wanted to tell you thank you. Uh, this has this for the for for you know featuring uh, the short films and stuff. One of my favorite reality shows. I think it was like 15 years ago. It got one season. It was called On the Lot. And mm -hmm. I'm not a huge reality show fan. But this show was centered around young filmmakers. In each yeah. episode, they were challenged with making a short film, a uh, different genre each week and everything. Yeah. And it was such a creative show. And there was so much creativity there. But it was just ahead of its time, I think. And uh, to, hear that, to hear what you're doing has given me a lot of hope. Because I love seeing. Because uh, there's so much passion and heart in that field. And uh, you don't see enough of that. Look, and, you know, I think it is. And I think um, one of the things I really dig doing is going around to... Uh, I love going to big film festivals because those are fun. I like going to smaller film festivals, too, because that's where you meet a lot of cool people. And, you know, I just went to one of my favorite festivals because it's run by two dudes that are really cool, by uh, um, uh, Mark and uh, Igor. Uh, it's called Popcorn Frights, and it's out of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and then they just expanded it an extra weekend and had a, a, a programming down in Miami. And so I went down to Miami a couple of weeks ago and hung out with those guys. And they were gracious enough and supportive enough. They uh, th they showed that was one of the festivals that Wolfman's Got Nards um, screened in. And, you know, we chose that, you know, kind of strategically because Wolfman traveled. Wolfman was in a lot of film festivals yeah, uh, and, and, and won a handful of awards, you know, not just in, in the States, but uh, internationally. But, you know, we, when I say we, you know, me and my studio partner, Pilgrim Media Group, we, we decided to strategize and not be in every single film festival that asked to be in. Because usually when you have a film and you want to festival it, you have to submit and uh, go to these festivals and get chosen. Uh, we submitted to a hand. I'm moving out of the sunlight here. Um, <laughs> the, sun, the, sun, the sun's moving in uh, in this room. He's a vampire. So, uh, that's right. <laughs> um, and we chose a handful that we would submit to, but we didn't really submit to most of them. We got requested, which is a complete, you know, uh, you know, wonder. You know, if you're a filmmaker, that's a dream. You know, is to have film festivals request your movie for their festival. And that started happening very early on, and we had such a good response. And Popcorn Fights was one of them that we ended up choosing just because of the location, who was in it, other programming they were going to have. And uh, Henry McComas and I went down there and enjoyed a weekend in Fort Lauderdale. And now we're friends with all the filmmakers that were there. Uh, we got oh, to yeah. hang out with, you know, we hung out with Chuck Russell because they showed the they showed 87 Blob, uh, you know, right uh, after um, uh, Wolfman and Chuck Russell is in Wolfman's Got Nards. Uh, he is, then, he is. I, we love Chuck Russell. Dream Warrior, spent, kid, man. Yeah, oh, yeah. Come on, and uh, we met Chuck um, in Philadelphia at a convention, and a friend of mine, Josh Goldblum, was hosting this kind of, uh, literally in a bar in Philadelphia, um, a screening of Dream Warriors uh, in a bar, uh, and it was projected on a, a bed sheet, and they were doing a... Let me get on this side of it. Yeah. They were doing a um, live commentary with Chuck Russell and Heather Lingenkamp. What? Uh, on a in, this, in this bar, uh, in the movie that's being shown, like on a sheet. And uh, Ryan and I, Ryan and I, ended up um, 
hosting the live commentary because <laughs> the guy that was going to do it ended up not doing it at the last minute and uh, they asked us to do it. So we did the live comment. And so prior to that event, uh, we had Chuck Russell and Heather in the green room and we set up our cameras and we sat them next to each other. Uh, I think it's the only interview in Wolfman where the subjects are kind of like in the same room and together, like there's two of them oh, we yeah. usually have singles and, and made it nice, but we were cramped in this little shitty green room in a bar in Philadelphia. Uh, but you're not going to, not get the opportunity to interview Chuck Russell and Heather Langenkamp and um, who are both great people, you know, who You're blowing ironically my, blowing my who, mind right now. dude. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it gets even, it gets even weirder because in this bar after the live commentary of dream warriors that we hosted with Chuck Russell and Heather Langenkamp projected on a bed sheet, Don Dawkin did an acoustic set live. Of dream, did he do dream? Of dream, did he do dream warriors? Or? Uh, of course, he closed with dream warrior. <laughs> Can he still hit the high notes like he used to? Uh, it's not bad. It's not. It's not, it's not bad. It's been. Why did Ira not tell us about this? <laughs> we were talking to. So we had Ira on this show. Ira Hayden. He was in Dream Warriors. He plays Will. He's the kid with the glasses, the D and D kid. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had him on the show. And uh, when so when we were talking to Ira or whatever, um, I can't remember. He was promoting Ghostbusters Afterlife because he's the voices of the Stay Puft Marshmallow, the minis. Right. So, um, but he um, he got sidetracked because he got mad at us because we <laughs> we brought up. I was talking to Josh and I brought up some other actor and we got off topic and he got so Andre. Okay. He got there. Real, real quick, I'll tell you what we did. All I did was made it. He brought up a. Uh, did I do that joke, you know, and I said, and I made a joke about how Jalil kind of came in and stole that show from the Stole rest Family of the Matters. Cast. Absolutely. Yeah, Re family recurring matters. character, not, yeah. not a lead character. Absolutely. No, one off. That's it. Yeah. You know, and, and I was like, in all fairness, the name of the show is Getting Sidetracked. So, yeah. yeah and he was like, <laughs> he, what he said to me was, Alex, uh, Jalil's not here. I'm here. And I was like, as soon as that happened, I was like, okay, the tone of the interview just got really off. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Yeah. Great guy, though. He was a great guy. Oh, mm. I was, I was a really. He had some amazing yeah. Brandon Lee stories. He was good friends with Brandon oh, Lee. Oh my god! Uh, wow. Yeah, believe yeah. it or not. So he had oh. some really cool backstories about Brandon and stuff. So yeah, Ira's a good dude. Um, but I was gonna say, Dream Warriors, Chuck Russell, Heather Langenkamp on Wolfman's Got Nards. She's talking about Wizard of Oz in that green room with you yeah. in the back room. And I remember, like, it was very similar. Like, I remember certain moves movies the peanuts cartoon would air once a year because mm -hmm. when we grew up in the 80s i mean if you missed the special you're not seeing yeah. it again for a whole nother year it was That's a right. big deal the That's grinch right. and everything well yeah. wait wait except for a christmas story because they played it for like four years <laughs> well, they, they, they didn't do that until like 99 or something yeah oh, exactly. way okay, later okay okay Oh, hey, which, Andre, which ironically I screen tested for in Toronto for Christmas Story. Oh, hell, which one did you play for Peter Billingsley's character? No, it was for Flick. Oh, oh that's for, really? Yeah, I'm glad yeah. you didn't get your eye put out. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think in the original script, if I remember this right, he actually does shoot his eye out. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> or or the the um, the the icicle hits him, uh, comes down and hits him in the eye. Mm. Yeah, that's I think that's what it was. Like you go and hits the eye and it puts his eye out. They're, hey, so they're actually, this is a little fun fact, they're making a sequel to the Christmas story with the original cast. It's like happening. Yeah. I thought they did that. They, it, that was a shitter. That was like a direct to Disney oh. Channel, okay. whatever. That had Daniel Stern as the dad from Home Alone and freaking Bushwhacked. No, this yeah. is the real deal. Where's the um, sequel to Monster Squad, man? They were going to do it. Hey. <laughs> it's look, time. Hey, they were going to do a remake of the Monster Squad in like 2014, Michael Bay, <laughs> Platinum Dunes. Yeah. And around the time andre when that was going on because he destroyed my ninja turtles okay? okay i said i lit some candles i said a prayer i had a rosary bead uh <laughs> and we got it stopped okay i take full credit <laughs> if he you oh, don't remake it was you good don't remake monster squad <laughs> don't remake back to the future don't remake gremlins don't remake gremlins. there's certain movies that just don't mess with from my childhood okay or i'm gonna have an issue with it what they need to do is have a direct sequel to the yeah. Monster Squad with the original cast, or Cobra Kai is huge right now. I'm telling you right now that if you had the correct people that were going to create the show and introduce it to YouTube or whatever, YouTube, Netflix, whatever, there's so many streaming platforms. Monster Squad, if it was done correctly to in today's 
year 2022, it could go. It would be popular. Yeah. I'm telling you right now. Uh, yeah. it, they've been they've been asking and talking about that for about five years. Um, Let's do even it. To, even to Fred and Shane. Um, Are you down? And then there's if. Well, it's always been a rights issue. So the whole thing with the right, it's always been a rights issue. And even when uh, uh, Bay and Platinum Dunes, along with Rob Cohen, were remaking it, um, they don't necessarily know if they actually had the rights to do it or not. Um, Because Paramount, for the last 10 or 12 years, has said, we own the rights to Monster Squad. Because we had to deal with Paramount uh, making Wolfman's Got Nards uh, with some of the BTS footage that we had, because they actually owned that. Uh, and then all of the Monster Squad footage that we used in Wolfman was fair use, so we didn't have to we didn't have to uh, purchase that. Beautiful. Um, <clears throat> even though the guy at Paramount tried to hijack the BTS stuff and make us pay for the Monster Squad footage, it was a whole thing. <laughs> um, yeah, it was kind of it's kind of a dick move. But um, mm-hmm. uh, when the the weird thing is is when you ask when you ask Paramount. Uh, to prove that they have the rights to Monster Squad, they are unable to. And so there's a thing in uh, media law that uh, after, if rights are in dispute and cannot be uh, proven um, after 35 years, they revert to the original authors. That's, that's what, what happened that, with like, Friday the 13th, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's they're bitching at each other, Sean, uh, you know, Cunningham and... Yeah. Oh, it's and fixed so, now. It's over so, now. Allegedly. Yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> so, you know, if anything happens with Monster Squad IP or anything else, uh, I think it's uh, now back in the hands that it's supposed to be. Uh, I don't know any updates. I know there's been, you know, uh, you know, various conversations over the last few years, but um, I don't think Shane or Fred are interested in uh, when they're in the room with giant names like Netflix and other things when <laughs> literally the story it it was it's been printed so it's 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 okay to tell the story but uh i think fred and shane were in a meeting together i think it was at netflix and they were like okay um so we really want uh i, I we want to do monster squad uh but we want to update it and we want it to um you know have the you know stuff but we want it to be about a group of kids that has to you know fight some supernatural powers um you know and you know have you seen have you seen Stranger Things? <laughs> and I think Fred and Shane were like, "Have you seen Stranger Things? Like yeah. you made it. Have you seen it? <clears throat> you guys are part of the original Stranger Things, man. right?" So Fred, I think Fred's uh, take on the meeting was, "Wait a minute, you want me to make a movie or a show about a show that you made about a movie that I already made?" That's <laughs> ridiculous. I think I think we've already done that. I don't think this is interesting. And then I think another meeting, if it was the same one or somewhere else. Um, the execs on the other side of the table this is very studio you know exec uh on brand was like okay so you know it's a group of kids and um you know they 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 find something and uh it's evil and they've got it they're the only ones that know about it and uh you know it comes after them but no one else knows and then they grow up and it's the same <laughs> but it's you know they grow up and then they have to do it again so it's it and- <laughs> <laughs> so 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 Shane, it's a great quote. Shane goes, that's it. <laughs> and the execs are like, yeah, that's what we want. He goes, no, 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 that's it. <laughs> They're like, yeah, that's what we want. He's like, no, that's Stephen King's it. <laughs> you, you're already airing it right now. <laughs> yeah. Like, who's on first? It's, it's like, right. <laughs> and, uh, but that's, uh, that, that's, very, um, that's very Hollywood, you know, for execs and, and, and studio suits. Um, Nobody wears suits anymore. It's great. It's like t-shirt and jeans and Chuck Taylors. But um, nice. the, uh, uh, you know, the, it's like, hey, whatever's hot and popular right now, we want that. And you're like, I yeah, wouldn't be surprised if a studio exec actually asked, you know, like, uh, shit, you know, what's, you know, what else is popular? Like the stranger, like let's go to the Duffer brothers and go, can you make a movie about five kids that find like a super <laughs> net? And they're like, we are, we're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it was making another one side up. You got They're like, going to be in the downside up on this. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, th- I think there's a lot there. I mean, there's obviously some cool stories, and there's a great, you know, there's great concepts for sequels or reboots or series or whatever. But um, you know, we'll see. I don't know. Um, I came up with a, a rad one about ten years ago <laughs> or eight years ago, and uh, you know, it, it 
I, I think if you did something like that, if you made it for the original fans first and then worried about the expanded audience, you'd be okay. Um, uh, but that's not how networks and studios want stuff. They want the giant audience first, and if you disenfranchise or you disrespect your core audience, they don't give a shit. That's what um, they that they, they did that with. I'm a huge Masters of the Universe uh, fanatic, and when they did the the reboot for um, not Kevin Smith's version, but the the child one, it's like He Man on Netflix. Also, yeah. it's totally. It's made for like seven year olds, and like so, basically, it's not getting renewed because the core audience that loves He Man is like, "What is this shit? Like, this is terrible." Right. And they're going with like, "Okay, this isn't for you, Alex. This is mm-hmm. for your friend's kid." Yeah, uh, yeah, which I get, which is why I've had to completely uh, separate and remove my Star Wars fandom because all the new Star Wars shit is not made for me. The Mandalorian. Um, and the, it's okay. I mean, even the movies, you know, even the well, the, the new films, the, the prequels, new trilogy, the new film, yeah, the, the, the new. There's only one. There's only one that has any Star Warsy in it, and it's actually the most Star Warsy movie of any Star Wars made, and that includes the original three, and that's the only one I like. Well, I was just gonna say the the new trilogy. I was talking to my friend the other day about this, and it was like, so basically, what you said when people pitch ideas that have already been done. It's like, what if we take, like, there's this, there's this person, and they're, and they're like poor, and they don't know who their real family is, and they're gonna be, they're gonna be really important and be a Jedi later on. But let's, let's make instead of Luke, let's just make it a female, and then uh, it, they just took the original three, and just and put them make, all in one. Yeah, they just, it is. Yeah. They yeah, just they, redid the same thing. They can, it can go the other way too, where they're, where they're. Uh, too much to their core audience like i thought the 2017 power rangers movie was oh, it's pretty good right. but it was but it was too uh niche you know it, di- it didn't expand to they couldn't expand it to a bigger crowd than the 30 somethings that went there to see it um, well that's the trick i mean you got to find some way to do that yeah and, they, you know they if you're did. talking about a sequel with monster squad it's very easy to do that you 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 pay you know pay uh, uh, homage to the original you fill in some plot holes you do some you know callbacks you have some faces you honor those uh and then it's a passing of the torch and you have new kids and there's yeah. a new adventure uh and i love a storyline you know it's, i'm not giving mine away but part of it is yeah we're back and we've got to you know kind of do it again for one of two reasons and um we 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 blow it like we, we, it doesn't just like we, the first, yeah, we, just like uh, the kids, Van Helsing back. Yeah, but our, but our kids have to come in and uh, actually they, they, they have the one, the solve. And I think that's, that's smart. Um, you know, Star Wars stuff. I don't, I mean, Disney doesn't give a shit. Disney wants to sell things and sell tickets to parks. That's all they, they want licensing. They want to yeah. sell, you know, and we learned all of that from, you know, Lucas's decision to uh, add Ewoks in at the end instead of <laughs> having a instead of having a really cool storyline for Return of yeah. the Jedi. You know, Afterlife found a really good balance uh, for nostalgia and bringing a new audience in. I really thought Ghostbusters Afterlife nailed it. Um, I wanted to ask you something about working as a kid on uh, Monster Squad before making the movie. Because I know as a kid, like, Halloween time, everybody was the mummy or the wolfman or Dracula, mm-hmm. but they weren't really scary, you know? Like, were you into them much as a kid before doing the movie? Uh, like, Universal Monsters? I knew of them. I had seen them, because I was actually, you know, I don't say that weird kid, because we're all weird, but... Um, mm-hmm. I, had, I loved watching television. I'd watch it late at night, and I'd watch it all day long Saturday. Uh, I get up early, you know, you have cartoons, sports, kung fu theater, and then old movies. And that's, I couldn't wait to Saturday, all day Saturday. And I'd either be playing in the neighborhood, you know, going on adventures, riding my bike, you know, things like that. And I'd come back and I'd watch all that. Um, I, I did. I watched late at night. I watched all, you know, old Frankenstein, old Wolfman's, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon's my guy. Uh, um, you know, whether you remember all these things or not, you've seen them. But see, I also, I actually grew up as a sci-fi kid. I was a sci-fi fan. So I really dug sci-fi stuff. And if sci-fi was scary, 
then even better. And so I would rather go see a movie about aliens or, um, you know, space faring adventure uh, than go see uh, Friday the 13th in 3D. Okay. But I went to them all. Yeah. Uh, or I'd go see a Bond movie with my dad. You know, that's, uh, in my, you know, my dad was a big Bond movie. And, uh, and, you know, I also grew up, you know, if you're late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s, teenager, um, you know, this is post Vietnam. So there's a lot of Vietnam social commentary movies coming out. Uh, and then still a lot of World War II stuff that was, you know, being made. Uh, and that's my dad's generation because, my, you know, my, my dad was older than my friend's dad's. But he was in between um, those wars. And, but it, it meant a lot. And so, you know, great World War II movies and definitely Cold War espionage thrillers. So, you know, that was my jam because of my dad. And so Bond was the campy end of Cold War espionage thriller. And if you had Gene Hackman in something, then it was the other end of it. So it was great. <laughs> nice. So Andre's got a great memory with his dad seeing a Bond film, Alex. And my, yeah. my memory with my dad is seeing Joe Schumacher's Batman and Robin. You know? oh, and, oh, yeah. Okay. And I have a hey, and you guys have those warm memories of you know films with your fathers, and I have an amazing memory of my mom spanking my ass because of its pat. So <laughs> we're all in the same boat. You still owe her three hundred dollars. Um, yeah, no. yeah. My, mine was awesome because uh, I I loved the drive-in, and we had one in L.A. where I lived. We actually had a bunch, and you could go to Van Nuys, you could go to Winnetka Four, and wow. I remember going to the Winnetka Four, which is right next to the Northridge Mall. And um, went my dad's big Ford, big ugly brown Ford Ford work car, and um, uh, I remember I, I we started going to the drive-in when you still put the can on your window. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. So you uh, but then the sound from the from the movie. But then when they changed the technology, which was space age shit, when you clipped that thing on your antenna and it came through your radio, that was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember one of the first movies we ever saw like that. We went and uh, I saw Octopussy at the drive-in. Oh, oh dude, God. James Bond, baby! Yeah. You were probably having a great time then. If you, yeah, that's right in your wheelhouse, dude. Yeah, the drive-in oh, uh, and Bond. Oh yeah, so, and and Maude Adams. I, I I think that was a very uh, uh, seminal moment um, uh, in my life to understand why Bond women are important and. Yeah, and I know. Act the impact they have on uh, the, yeah. the male psyche. And because uh, Maude Adams blew my mind. I was like, who just is a that? Guy, yeah, just a I was time. like, who is that? So once again, Andre has this coming of age moment with his dad watching Bond. And all I got is me and my dad 10 minutes into Batman and Robin going, what the hell did Arnold Schwarzenegger just say? <laughs> really? <laughs> Hey, Andre, before we kind of wrap this up, man, I so I used to work for Fox Sports uh, in my background. I was a Fox Sports radio guy uh, yep. for three or four years. And then COVID kind of COVID kind of took that away because you couldn't have two people in the same uh, studio at the same time. Fox oh, was really. Geez. Yeah, yeah, they were really weird about having. So I was like the producer. I did the like the sound. and I was the co-host. So I'd kind of drop in and yeah, be, I was a sidekick, whatever. So. I, when I was kind of researching your background a little bit, man, you were into sports, dude. You played golf. You played college basketball. Yeah. Uh, what other sports did you play? So are you a scratch golfer? Oh, I wish. Uh, right now I'm an eight. My index so, is a – well, my index is a 7.8, so I'm an eight. You're, de um, you're decent, though, dude. That's good. I, I'm decent, and I could be yeah. better if I would just, you know – I, I I played this morning. I slid a lot of putts right by. I was like, I hit. I couldn't hit the ball any better all day, and I oh, just man. couldn't drop. I just couldn't drop these six seven footers today. And sometimes I do. Uh, golf is my main jam right now. I grew up playing all sports, um, but basketball was sort of my favorite. Even though I'm the uh, short, stocky guy, um, I point guard. I, yeah, I'm a I'm a point guard. Okay. If you look, <laughs> my Twitter handle of all the things I've done in my life, my Twitter handle starts out with point guard. Um, and that's never changing because uh, I approach everything I do from the mentality of a point guard. And um, yeah, I had a great experience. I played four years in college at two different schools and uh, had a, a, you know got asked. Uh, my dream was to play uh, overseas after that, and um, ended up getting an offer and didn't do it. So I still it was still great. Um, and I was technically better at all the other sports. I just put more time in into basketball yeah. and. That was also the sport that 
everybody my senior year in high school when I said that's what I wanted to do. They said, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I said, you're insane. And I was like, but that's what I want to do, and I'm going to go do that. And yeah. no, no one supported it. No one thought it was a good idea. Uh, and uh, I went and did it, and um, I enjoyed giving everybody the bird. And, yeah, no. um, you know, but, you know, that kind of, that, that led me on a different path for a while. And, you know, I even worked at, I was a sports writer at newspapers for a number of years and, Excellent. um, you know, got, uh, you know, got through that and, you know, could have gone in the coaching route and, uh, could have gone in the officiating route. I was a high school basketball official for a couple of years and you can uh, make extra money on the weekends doing that, man. Pretty decent. Yeah. And, Dude, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it, I, that was actually something I almost regret not, pursuing i just didn't want to at the time because i got i got heavily recruited uh to be a college official and uh that you know that would have been pretty yeah i, I was i was actually i was actually a very good official and um i, I could have made a thing out of that but i was like eh. yeah <laughs> um but yeah sports was always a big um was always a big uh, a big deal um you know either playing or enjoying them and then ended up working in an industry with one of my best friends i'm actually sitting in this house right now but um who started a company that uh, you know is now you know one of is is the largest sports travel uh, ticketing and hospitality company in the country, and um, I've I started working there and ran a department of that company for years, and um, I got totally burnt out on sports. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I uh, and I just don't like the state of sports. I don't like um, I know it's a whole era. I just don't enjoy it as much. Um, I think the money's ridiculous. Uh, it's ruined everything. Uh, now, uh, I've never been a big gambler. I don't, I don't mind if someone's into gam gaming and, and, mm -hmm. and sports prop betting and all that. That's fine. If you enjoy that, I, that's great. It's not my, it's not my jam. Um, I also think that has an effect to ruin sports, uh, uh, more and, um, I, you know, but it's not my era. It's fine. It's like the star Wars movies. It's not for me right now. There's yeah. other things that I'm interested in. Uh, but I love golf. And then now we got controversy in that. Damn it. You know, live, it's like, live, can we not, can for, we, man. why does someone got to come in and ruin something? Just let me have it. Go away. They, um, so the, yeah, no, the live tour is like, Josh, I know you don't, you're not really into sports that much, but this live tour is like kind of Saudi money backed. It's, a, oh, they're offering oh, ridiculous yeah. amounts of money for people to leave the PGA tour, which is basically the NBA, the MLB, NFL, um, they offered Tiger Woods seven hundred and fifty million dollars to come play oh, events, wow. and Tiger Tiger was like, "No, I'm good. I'll just open my putting uh, my putting golf course down in Florida." Well, I've eight, yeah. it's, this is a serious thing. Gol P Tiger Woods just opened an eighteen hole putting golf course in Florida, and it's like a really big deal, by the way. Uh, yeah. So it's like putters. Putter's Paradise Mini Golf in Coos Bay, Oregon, on steroids, designed by the world's <laughs> greatest golfer ever. Table tennis, they're coming for you next. Yeah, they they, um, may. they they're 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 going to own everything. But, um, you know, I you know, I would have traded them if outside, you know, entities um, are going to just buy something. I would have traded the professional tag league and cornhole. But leave me golf. Like, you know, it's fine. <laughs> curling. Um, oh, no, don't mess with curling. I'm a curling yeah. fan. I like curling. Curling's fascinating to me. Um, uh, dude, dude yeah, so Andre. You, you can have the other ones. But, yeah, golf is my jam. I. Golf and yoga. You know, I had a weird year last year, like I said, and um, I used to be super active. Um, I'm 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 still active, but golf and yoga uh, is sort of the only thing I, I I'm super active now. Um, it's what happens when you have a massive heart attack. And, you yeah, know, I and I didn't want to bring that up. Um, oh no, feel free. It's fine. okay. So Josh, uh, Andre had like a hundred percent blockage in like you know uh, in his court. It wasn't what part like a hundred percent blockage on the. Coronary car carotid yeah. artery, or was it my, the my my right coronary artery? Because you have well, you know, they say three, but you have four arteries that supply your heart muscle with uh, blood and oxygen. Not the blood in your heart, but you know the arteries that supply the muscle. Yeah, to life. and um, your right, my right coronary artery ruptured, and uh, in, uh, uh, internally, so it was it was it was blocked a little bit, and then it ruptured. And when that happens, your body responds by uh, clotting. So it needs to plug the hole. And um, what happens most of the time is that clot grows too big and cuts off the blood supply to that side of the heart, uh, and you have a heart attack. And um, I was playing tennis with one of my best friends and oh, uh, and um, started feeling a little weird. And um, you know, I went through a massive amount of experience in a very short amount of time and um, came very close to checking out. So. 
I'm so, so Andre. I'm so glad, I'm glad that glad you you're didn't. With this. Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah. I I saw your t so I remember when this happened, and I tweeted you, and that's how I actually first contacted you. I just said, "Hey, man, I hope you feel better." You were in the hospital. You gave the thumbs okay. up. Oh yeah, yeah. Did I respond you, to your you, message? You responded to okay. the tweet. Yeah, you responded to okay. the tweet. Okay. And then I, I, I tried, which is hard. I got a lot. And then I wish you a happy birthday. I was gonna. So I was gonna say though. Um, I was really confused, man, because, so, Andre, I used to weigh, like, 358 pounds, Okay. Um, and in the last three years, I've lost, you know, I've worked out every day for three straight years, dude. Fantastic. So, it's impressive. It I absolutely say, is. When I saw your photos, though, and I knew you were an athlete, I was perplexed, because I was like, how did Andre have this massive heart attack when he's played sports his whole life, he's been fit for, for you know, his whole life, he's not overweight, really? Right. Like, what right. the hell happened? Did they say what happened? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, and, and what you're talking about is what we, you know, we always, uh, associate with health and fitness, uh, or fitness and, and mm -hmm. health. Um, uh, lifestyle is super important. Like you've got to take care of your body. Uh, you know, if you're a few pounds overweight, it does wonders to not be overweight. Uh, and you've done, I mean, that's super impressive. And thank you. Uh, but you know, I, I've never been a big drinker. I've never smoked. I don't use, um, I eat super clean, um, healthy. I don't eat junk food. I haven't had a soda in like 12 years. Um, wow. Uh, you know, and, uh, I eat pretty much light, clean food. Uh, you know, every once in a while, you know, you have slices of pizza or something, but, um, I, that's how I've always been. <laughs> Yeah. And most of my friends were like, wait a minute, if you had a heart attack, I am screwed. Yeah, that's what and, I thought, dude. When right. I saw you, I was like, I'm fucked. Well, well the, 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 the reality of that is, is lifestyle is super important. You know, how you treat your body, what you do to it, what you put into it, what you put on it, and how you think inside of it, you know, affects you. That's super important. It's always secondary to genetics. And um, you can have people that abuse their body left and right uh, and just end up having a genetic, you know, kind of combination that they can last and they yeah. won't have all these degenerative stuff or have these issues. So that's right. And, um, you, you know, uh, obviously Keith Richards has fantastic genetics somewhere, uh, <laughs> even though he's British, uh, but uh, he got a combination somewhere, but uh, it, it really is secondary to genetics. And, you, you know, you're always fighting. If you have bad genetics in certain areas, uh, you're, you're fighting uphill. And then you've got to be really, really cognizant of your lifestyle or your activity. Um, I never, you know, kind of really uh, worried about it for too long because I was always eating well or not always active. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, the message is no matter what you think you are or doing, make sure you stay updated. Make sure you go to the doctor. Make sure you get tests, you know, do lab work, um, get your yearly physical um, especially when you get to 40, 45, um, start, you know, start paying attention to things. Don't assume. Don't um, I right. had had a, I, yeah, that's right. I had a couple of years where I didn't stay on top of things and maybe, or maybe we would have caught it, but I don't, I, I don't think so. This was something yeah. that, you know, I had had some buildup and some blockage in that artery apparently. And, um, I also, uh, am not a very stressful person, never have been. Um, but that year, the year and a half or two leading up to that was probably the most uh, outside stressful and oxidative kind of um, effect that I probably ever had experienced in my life. And I think all of those things, plus some physical stuff, um, all came uh, and got me at this at the uh, at, at the same time. So it just kind of all it, they all comboed up to uh, you know to punch me out. And um, but they didn't. You came but back, they, but they didn't. And I think the reason I made it through that hour um, or 45 minutes uh, is because of the lifestyle and because of the activity. Um, a lot of people don't get that opportunity. Uh, luckily, I was where I was, uh, who I was with doing what I was doing and not far from where I needed to be critically in a very short amount of time. So those things had lined up in my favor as well. And a lot of that, you know, uh, you know, I, I thank my buddy, Mike. Um, who was with me and um, got me to where I needed to be. My wife is actually an LPN, so she's always on me, like constantly. Yeah. About what I'm eating and drinking, and she's also a huge fan of yours. 
Oh, well, she, she's tell at, her I said hello. <laughs> she's at work right now, and she oh, asked good for her. if I could get you to say hello to her. Her name's Beth. Her name uh, is Beth. Yes, if you could say hello to Beth, that would be awesome. Well, hello, Beth. It's Andre here. Thank you for being a fan, and um, I hope you're doing well at work and helping people, and uh, I guarantee you you're not getting enough credit for what you're doing. Uh, so I will give you a little bit of that today. And just so you know, Beth, uh, the, the name Beth uh, was one of my first actual crushes in third grade. Uh, her name was Beth Rose, uh, and I always love the Kiss Ballad Beth. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> awesome. So next time I hear that song, I will dedicate it to her. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I don't know if I should be jealous or what. No, thank you. Man. No, no, celebrate it. It's good. It's fine. It's good. No, what I'm, song I'm, would you like? To, what song would you like? To, uh, I'm, so, I'm so glad that you got through that, man. Seriously, that I, I appreciate it. It was, um, it, it was a weird. Um, it was certainly a weird experience. Um, but I was there and awake and active the entire time. Uh, and then you realize, you know, when it's all said and done, and you know, a, a, a very um, capable uh, team and a cath lab at a at a hospital in Las Vegas saves your ass. Um, and I was the the second of five that day that they uh, had in that cath lab. And uh, yeah, and uh, while I was in there waiting for my ICU room, someone else was coming up the elevator that needed to be on the table that I was on. Oh. And um, yeah, I mean, these are these happen every day. And, you know, so that's sort of the message too. Uh, one of the cath lab staff asked me, he's like, you were playing tennis this morning? I said, yeah. And he said, hmm, he said, it's probably the best thing that you did today. I said, uh, what do you mean? He goes, well, what happened to you happens all the time while we're sleeping in the morning. And you don't okay. know it. And you and you don't know it. And um, I wish he had waited like a day to tell me that because then I started freaking out a little bit. And uh, <laughs> he goes, yeah, so you being up and active and with people, that's what uh, mm -hmm. that probably it's probably while you're still around. And uh, I said, oh, OK, I'll take that. Um, and like I said, you know, things lined up, but, uh, you know, you know, don't take anything for granted. Don't assume. Um, yeah, I kind of created a new motto for my, it doesn't have to just be my, you know, my dude friends of certain age. It can be anybody, um, but mostly men don't pay attention and they don't want to go get stuff looked at yeah. um, is uh, you'd rather uh, you'd rather be wrong than too late. Mm -hmm. um so if something's weird just go you know go go ask you know look at it research it yourself find out if it's something you should be worried about go see your doctor go get something checked um a lot of us that are 40 45 50 um we're going down like it's it's weird um it's not just cancers and and car wrecks um it's strokes it's 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 heart attacks um a lot of stuff's going on now so just you know try to take care of yourself and um you know always always sort of be aware and uh, if something's wrong figure it out find out you'd rather be wrong than too late you and alex uh with with with, with everything you're saying and what alex has been doing y'all could put together a hell of a motivational video because yeah. man he has spent every day going out and putting out these positive messages to people when he's running and he oh great so yeah much, so well, let's much. go on the road and like do speeches hey like, man we'll do i'll do it, it. You set well, it up, I'll show up. Well, let's. I'll go get in contact with uh, Steve, the owner of Fox Sports Radio in town, and I'll say, "Listen, we're getting, we're gonna get some big names here, and we're gonna motivate the shit out of some people around the world. And then also, we're gonna plug into David Goggins, the Marine. I don't know if you're familiar with David Goggins. We're gonna get him on stage and tour with us. Do uh, it. Push up challenges. Uh, yeah. And and dips. So yeah. <laughs> I I used to be able to do good dips. Uh, you know, what's funny is leading up to the heart attack. Um, that was on July 3rd of last year. It's been a year and change. Uh, for 60 days, I was actually uh, working out and no one kind of knew. But the 30 days prior, I did it publicly on Instagram with my followers. And I did, oh, yeah. I did uh, an activity challenge. It wasn't a fitness challenge. It wasn't like, a, you know, we got to run three miles in 18 minutes challenge. It wasn't a fitness challenge. It was just an activity challenge. It was called Active with Andre, like hashtag yeah, okay, Active with Andre. Something. Just do something. Yeah. And because we'd all been sitting around for two years, right? And mm -hmm. I had a lot of people follow and they sent me their videos and they, you know, they liked it and then they did their own and they hashtagged it. I didn't go, you know, I don't have a giant following, but it was, you know, the ones that did it were amazing. 
because I had a I had a uh, uh, an ulterior motive behind it is I was supposed to the next week, uh, like July twelfth or so, I was supposed to go to Texas to be the lead in a film that my friend Derek Johnson was making, that he wrote the script for me. I was supposed to be the lead. And I needed to get in shape a little bit. So I just wanted to, you know, trim down, you know, I was eating, I was eating super clean for a month and I was working out every day, doing something. I was swimming, walking, doing yoga. You know, I was actually lifting with my buddy, Mike or playing tennis. And I did it active for 30 days. And the day before I had the heart attack was the, was the last day of the challenge. God, it's everybody. And I I woke up the next morning and (laughs) An artist. And everybody saw your post that's been following for 29 days, and they're like, so this is what happens after 30 days? Fuck that. That's right. Wait, um, he's like, uh, is this today's challenge? That's yeah. right. Is, is this mandatory? Andre's like, like no, statistically, no. Uh, I'm the only one who's going to make it out of this 30th day here. That's right. Uh, yeah. No, dude, so yeah, I was going to so say, good. Andre, I was going to say what he said, though, about, like, the... I always... So I would always talk about, like, you never know who's watching, right? You never know who, yeah. who's who's... So you always want to be kind and you kind of want to, I've never had anyone get pissed off at me cause I was nice to them. But <laughs> right. so when I first started exercising, dude, I was like 358 pounds. I could not even walk a mile. So Ooh, yeah. around my apartment complex, it's like a mile, 1.2 miles. So I would just walk my fat ass around the block, 1.2 miles for 30 minutes. So a year goes by and then two years goes by and all of a sudden I'm down like 140, whatever. This guy who managed a, a, a store and lock facility, like a storage facility where you put, mm-hmm. you know, storage wars, whatever. Yeah. He yeah. pulls me aside. Like he, he grabs me from, I, I thought he was a cop or something. He like pulls me aside. He's like, Hey, I need to talk to you. And I was like, what the hell is this about? And he's like, I want to talk to you. I've seen you every day yeah. for two years, go around this block and you motivated me. And I lost a hundred pounds. Some dude I don't even know who yeah. ran a storage facility, Andre. It was bizarre, man. I and mean, you got to take that. I mean, that's uh, that's good on you. And and, yeah. and and literally that makes you feel good. I've yeah. I've had I've had a handful of friends and a handful of you know fans and some are friends that are fans that uh, have said, hey, you know your experience, and then you keep talking about it. I've actually gone and looked at something, and we found something that I'm treating. It's amazing because uh, who knows in two years that could have come up and checked me out, and I was like, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, you know, if I was the, uh, you know, catalyst to that, then I will definitely, uh, take pride in that. And yeah. what's, what's really funny is, uh, it's something else that I've, you know, I've, I, I'm always in my notebook coming up with ideas or projects and that's just how it is. And I was just on the phone for an hour for, for a big thing with my buddy in Asheville. And, um, uh, this was, I don't know, five, six years ago, um, I had wanted to start a um, a men's health awareness campaign. Not a not a company, not a nonprofit. Because um, I don't know if you remember. Depends on where you are. I, it was big in the South. Uh, you know, for um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, there's always awesome campaigns because mm-hmm. it's a it's about a it's just awareness. It's like, and they've got to come up with such great things for people to even think about it. Pink bats and, and baseball. The pink and all bats. And, okay, so now yeah. the NFL. I mean, that's giant awareness and exposure. And there was a um, a great campaign um, in where I was living at the time for a number of years, and it was a ribbon, and it had merch, and it was and it said "Save the Tatas," and I thought that was the best one of all of them because it was so cheeky and it was so on point, and it just you're like, "Yep, yeah, I support that one. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna buy the shirt." I you know it's a fantastic it's on point, <laughs> and it was just a uh, it was just awareness campaign and. Of course, then I moved back out to LA, and I because I, I moved to do this uh, television show concept where I shot the shot the shot the uh, kind of first part of it to pitch, and I'm doing that, but then I ended up doing short ends and doing uh, the documentary instead of this big television show, and um, I wanted to. I had my lawyer uh, start, you know, kind of going through the process of starting um, a men's health awareness campaign that covers everything. Uh, and I think I'm going, you know, when I was, you know, recovering last year and when I was, and I called it save the nards <laughs> and, um, I That's wanted phenomenal. to, I, I wanted, I, 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 it's another, I think I'm going to, it's just, it's probably just a website and maybe a couple events, speaking engagements, you know, things like that. And, um, it, it, you know, you don't, it's hard to be a nonprofit cause it's the way you have to operate and do all that. What you want to, you want to attach to a nonprofit that you can operate under. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want it to be sort of like an awareness thing, a campaign, an event thing where people celebrate. Maybe it's just a social media thing now. Uh, but I literally started that like six or seven years ago and, and stopped. And, um, that's one of my things I'd actually like to kick into gear again. That is brilliant. And the amount of money you could make off merch to, to help the, to help awareness. I mean, I, I'm serious, man. And we it just sells itself. I, I'm yeah, serious, dude. That just sells itself. That. And, and so, so much so, yeah, maybe I'll get it and we'll come back on and we'll promote the brand. Right. Um, you want, I, man. I actually had a, I made a shirt that I used to wear to conventions way back in the early days and it said save the nards on it because <laughs> I thought it was just fun and cheeky. And then yeah. I created the campaign and I never, I never went to the next step, uh, but all that development stuff is there. Um, and maybe it's because now is a better time. I think well, now, now is the time. Now Andre, is the time. Sure. I'm, I'm good friends with a guy named Ethan Nicole. He actually um, created Axe Cop which was a cartoon and a comic book that was on uh, Animation Domination on Cartoon Network for like two yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he also has done work for Teen Titans Go. He's written some episodes. He's, he, yeah, he's a done a bunch job. of stuff. Yeah. His name's Ethan Nicole. He's an incredibly talented artist, and I'm, I'm very good friends with him. So if you ever want his contact information for like to do a logo for Save the Nards, he oh. would come up, dude, he Love would it. come up with some good shit for you. Yeah, and put us in touch. I mean, I will. You know, it's, I will. it's always cool to you know meet you know cool people like that anyway. And I'm, we yeah. probably know some of the same people. If, oh, know, I'm sure you do. He's, animation world. he's good friends with uh, the creator of Earthworm Jim, uh, Doug Tenapple. I love that. Um, he hangs out. He's kind of got a, a Pat Oswalt. He's good friends with Pat Oswalt from yeah. King Queens and those guys. Um, but yeah, no, I'll I'll definitely connect you guys. Um, do you have anything else you're plugging, man, before we wrap up? Or? You know, I think uh, I, I may have officially just relaunched Save the Nard, so maybe that. Um, that's breaking news. That's breaking, breaking news. news. Uh, right, you know, you've heard it here first. Uh, hashtag Save the Nards. Uh, I own it, uh, so don't go try to do it. <laughs> it's it's um, mine. That's right. Um, you know, like I said, Ryan and I just got off a set of a movie called uh, The Demons Within, which is a, a small local production out of Northwest Ohio uh, that was produced by this cool dude named uh, Cody Hesserling, uh, who is actually a nurse uh, and not a film producer, uh, nice. and uh, directed by uh, Stephanie Hensley. Uh, so we got to go up to uh, Northwest Ohio and shoot some cool, uh, some cool footage in this demon movie or this possession movie. Um, so you know, keep an eye open for that. Um, I, I did it. I, I I'm involved with this group of Dallas filmmakers now, uh, called Retro Freaks. And uh, Ryan and I, I don't know when you're going to air this episode, you know, uh, uh, exactly. But uh, in the middle of December, Ryan and I are. I'm sorry, the middle of October. The middle of October, um, Ryan and I are back on the road. Um, we'll be in Dallas for a screening of that film. Uh, and a launch party for the next uh, next thing of their projects. And then we're doing signings in Dallas for two days at, at, a, at a toy store and then at a horror store. And then we're at a convention called Retro Palooza. Uh, and then we go to four um, Alamo draft houses the next week to do uh, Halloween Monster Squad screenings. Oh uh, my we'll, God. Awesome. We'll, we'll be in uh, Houston, uh, San, uh, Houston, Austin, San Antonio. And then Halloween night is uh, San Francisco. And uh, if you're Vegas based or near Vegas based on October 1st, Ryan and I will be at Tom Devlin's Monster Museum. This will probably air after that. But uh, even if it is, go check out Tom Devlin's Monster Museum in Vegas. It's a cool spot. We'll be there signing. And uh, so that's why October is kind of chock full right now. Yeah, and it sounds um, like it. I, I just booked uh, I just booked a flight uh, to go to Albuquerque for a couple of days to scout some locations. Uh, my man, Henry McComas who made the documentary uh, with me um, uh, is a fantastic uh, 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 story developer, a screenwriter and a director. Uh, and hopefully this will be his directorial debut. So um, producer of that. And so we're trying to get that off the ground. So a lot of stuff's going on right now. So a yeah. uh, lot, lot, lot of cool things. Yeah, you got it going on. Josh, well, you, hopefully. You can ask hopefully. him the question, huh? Yeah, I'm going to ask him that question, but I've got a yes or no question for you guys. We're not going to deep dive. It's, okay. just new, it's a new thing for getting sidetracked. Yes or no, Alex? Yes or no, Andre? Quantum Leap, Quantum Leap remake. Yes or no? Yes. 
yes, because I loved the first one. Me too. Okay. So and mo- and, mo- and most people will say no, because I liked the first one. Yes, yeah, because I, I liked the first one. Let's, let's, let's go. Yeah. I was, just, I was just curious. I saw the ad for yeah. it, so I was curious. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't. I'm. A, I'm looking forward to it. I. Uh, you know, we've got technology. We've got new stories. We've got new stuff to jump into. Um, hell, Quantum Leap OG was so old. Now they can leap into that time. <laughs> it's like you know, they could. They could. So uh, it's, uh, there's there's a lot happening in the last 25 years. The before we get to the last question, real quick, I was going to say Quantum Leap was one of the shows I watched uh, religiously daytime TV because it was on. It was syndicated, and yeah. the episode where Scott Bakula jumps into his own family's uh, timeline where he's trying to like save his dad from a heart attack. Do you guys right. remember that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. that episode stuck with me, and I remember his. Uh, I can't remember. Was it Al or Ziggy or whoever was in charge of like the jumps? Like he he kind of directs him through the right. episodes, but he has out. Yeah. Oh, he's Al, like, no, you're right. Yeah. You're yeah. Right. He's like, don't. He's like, don't try to get your dad not to have a heart attack. We're trying to save dipshit over here. We're not trying to. And I just remember being like eight and thinking of all these different angles in my head of how I would handle that. It was Yeah. I mean it brought up uh, that brought up yeah, very thought provoking. I yeah. enjoyed, what would you do what would you do in that situation? It's tough. Yeah. Pretty good. I I enjoyed Scott Bakula's cameo in Always Sunny in Philadelphia when they did a, a episode with some leaping. Um anyways, <laughs> we got to ask you Andre, we got to ask you. Yeah. Uh, we're being forced. We're he's forcing us to do season three master evil is forcing us to watch horrible horrible horror movies constantly Mm. is there any way you can think to save us or get us out of it what do you think what do you say um yeah i'm gonna have to go with um i know um you're gonna yeah um i mean you asked for it you got to take it um you got to sit through it and um yeah, I mean, I have to go and do fun stuff, so I'm gonna let you do that. Okay. Okay. Story of our lives. We tried another season. Season three got renewed. Didn't even know we were. We don't even get paid. We're just chained to a wall. There's literally shackles on our ankles right now, Andre. Andre's so busy. I get it. I get it. He's yeah, booked, yeah. I mean, yeah. But ooh, look at the time. I'd love to help, but uh, yeah. Uh, ooh, yeah. Gotta go. The first time I ever saw Monster Squad. I was at a sleepover party with a friend of mine. It was on HBO. Every time we go to the video store, that's what I rent. I even had a bootleg DVD. The word got out. Everything we had seen up till then had all been kid stuff, and this was the first taste of something dangerous. These kids are real kids. We were a part of the squad. We went to school with them, and we are them. This movie resonates. They put up the ticket saying Monster Squad Reunion. It sold out real fast. Wait, you know this movie? I never got the sense that this movie was finding a new audience or that its original audience were enjoying it again. I did try to start my own Monster Squad. We never actually performed any jobs. You find lifelong friends because you have this one weird thing in common that nobody else knows about. This is a zine I did. It's called I Had Rudy. Wow. What a really pleasant surprise that this seed that we planted grew into something. It's like shooting a basket in 1987 and then it doesn't go in until 20 years later. Mother says that it's okay.